Shao Wei, welcome to Shao Chinwag. Wei. Welcome to Chinwag. Hail. Hail, mighty Caesar. There is a debate about the V. Should it be a hard V or should it be a soft V? Should it be Vini Vidi Vici uh -huh. or Weenie Weedy 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 Yeah. I Frankly, came, I Weenie saw, Weedy I Weedy Yeah, Weenie Weedy Weedy doesn't. I, the, a hard V is what it should be because it sounds silly. Otherwise. I agree. You that's Julius picture. Caesar, isn't it? Yeah. I came, I saw, I conquered. That's, right, uh, exactly. That's Julius Caesar. Did you take Latin in school? I did, and my teachers liked the soft V, so it was like, and I didn't care for that. No. And there was this big debate about it. Uh, but uh, de gustibus non est disputandum, as I wow. always say. Wow, that's, you know, that's fantastic. That's right. To each his own. That's right? right. There's no disputing. Very nice. There's no disputing taste. Yes. Basically, is what it is. You right? you did uh, Latin as well, or are you getting it I from did. Your I Italian did Latin. Or? Yeah, I did a lot of Latin. <laughs> just just naturally in my DNA, Steve. Okay. The Latin it's... just pours out of me. <laughs> that and I make a great bolognese, and I'm. Uh, and, uh, this is yeah. a theme on our show. The chinwag <laughs> is constantly riding you about you. Harping on my Italian American ancestry. My Italian ancestry. <laughs> Absolutely. I embody all of them. But no, I did I did take Latin, and it's funny how I remember none of it. And I took it for a uh, long time, and I really I liked it, but I don't remember a thing about it. It's really weird. It's all gone, except Salve. But then when you go to, like, when you go to Italy every now and then, or, you know, you go to churches, it's great because a lot of the stuff is in Latin. Can you, That's like, true. read it, or you kind no, of... Can, I can sort oh. of get the gist of some things. It's actually really, it's hard. It's yeah. a really, it's a, it's harder than you'd think it is, especially when you get into all those poets and stuff. It gets really hard. Yeah. The one thing I remember is I think it's salve, morituri te salutant, is the one thing that I remember, which is Death. the gladiators. Uh-huh. You got that. Say all it right. one more time. Let me see it. Salve, salve. Yeah. So. I guess that's, I guess they said that's that. That's the greeting. It's, yeah. Morituri te salutant. I think morituri that's how it's said. Se te... Oh, man. I know it's about death, but I yep. don't know what the moratorium te salutant is supposedly what the gladiators said before it started, and they said, "Hail Caesar! We who are about to die salute you." Awesome! Like we are who are about to rock. Yes, it's for, like those, for those <laughs> for those about, about, about to rock. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. God bless ACDC. <laughs> Those guys still around? They're not. They're all dead, aren't they? No, no. There's there's a couple of them still hanging on, still really? rocking, still about God. to rock. So good for those about so to rock. Good. Well, speaking of rocking, we, we, we're still rocking here at the Chinwag, amazingly. Thanks to all of our uh, fine and loyal listeners. Yeah. yeah we we actually you. met a bunch of you for some live shows recently, and that was we so did. much fun. That so was great. great. Such an amazing bunch of people. So yeah. smart, so interesting, weird in the best possible ways. And just great. And so thank you. And and continue your support, if you will, please. Please give us those five stars, if you would. Give and, us the uh, thumbs up, as the yes. emperors did in ancient Rome. Except I think it's back. I think we have it backwards. I think the thumbs up from the emperors was kill him, actually. Oh, my and God. We should down have asked. Was, Don't kill him. I know. We, well, we should have asked. We should have asked because we, we, we had the great good fortune today of speaking to one of the great living historians, uh, not just in her field, I think just a great historian, yeah, Mary Beard, who yeah, is- Dame uh, Mary Beard. She is Dame a Dame. Dame Mary Beard, oh. uh, yes. And she, uh, we've been wanting to talk to her for a long time. Yeah. I'm a huge admirer of hers. So am I. And I'm, a, I'm very into Roman history. And the idea that we've actually are able to speak with her is, extraordinary to me yeah i think she broke it open like with this book spqr that that is like a way of thinking about rome that people weren't it's really down in the everyday life of the romans um and the average citizen and that's yeah. really amazing she wrote this history spqr a couple of years ago which is a great sort of accessible yeah. history of rome but a lot of it's about just the sort of the life of Rome and not necessarily all the people we know about, but the people right. we don't know anything about. Dame Mary Beard, first dame we've ever had on Chinwag. She's the author of, not among many other things, the best selling Fires of Vesuvius, which is a great book about Pompeii, Women in Power, a manifesto, and the National Book Critics Circle Award nominated Confronting the Classics, as well as the book you just mentioned, SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome. Her latest book is Emperor of Rome, which it's fantastic because it's a really great, smart 
way of kind of accessing a lot of the history by talking about these emperors, these sort of figures that we do think we know a lot about or think we have some idea about, but we may not, in fact. And she she also has an amazing sense of humor and is a great storyteller. So people imagine that if you're a classicist, you must be kind of a dry, dusty bore. No. She is very far away Fantastic. from that. Fantastic. Yeah. And makes it super accessible and super exciting. And uh, here we go. Salwe, Mary Beard. Hello, Mary Beard. Thank you so much for joining us on the Chinwag. You're in Texas, I understand? Uh, I'm in Dallas, yes. Dallas, so, uh, okay. Yeah. A, a, have you been there before? <laughs> yeah, I have. It's got a wonderful art museum. Where That's I, true. Yeah. It does indeed. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm a big admirer and, and, and I'm a great fan. And so it was very exciting to be able to talk to you. I'm also somebody who, you probably heard this recent internet meme of men. <laughs> yes. yes, I had a feeling you heard you're, it. You're one of those men, guys. Men, no, no, this is what, this is my point. Men think about the Roman Empire every seven seconds or something like that as opposed to women, well, which is interesting. What's your take on that? Do you, do you think it's true that men are more drawn to the subject than women? Well, Look, I'd like to say that this was a whole publicity campaign that was dreamt For up your by book. my publisher. <laughs> yes. We were saying that, we were <laughs> guessing that. <laughs> but my publishers absolutely deny this. I, I think it's, you know, I think it is really interesting. Uh, and of course, I'm very pleased because I want to say to all those people who do think about Rome, every seven seconds. Look, guys, you can come and think about it in an even more interesting way, right? That's right. right. Yes, um, exactly. I'm not quite sure why they do it, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody <laughs> who does think about Romans so often. I do think it's quite a safe space to enjoy those kind of fantasies of a particular sort of male. Interesting. Race, you know? They're 2,000 years ago. It doesn't matter. They wear silly skirts and togas, <laughs> but they're real men. <laughs> and there's a, there's, a great, there's a great fantasy world, which, you know, I'm, I'm quite keen on. I, you know, I like the idea of people using Rome for their fantasy as long as they then move on and find right. out in a Learn bit. Learn the real stuff. Yes, yeah, some yeah. more of the real stuff. You Get know, deeper. I bet, you know, I bet that most of the, of the fantasists don't see themselves as enslaved people or uh, the poor. I mean, it is a fantasy about being powerful, isn't it? Yes. You're always a general yes. or an emperor. Yes. Well, that's what was interesting. That's what I wanted to start with because it, I thought to myself, okay, why was why have I been so interested? And I suppose there's some low level machismo going on, probably <laughs> with me, even though I don't I don't think of myself as a macho guy. But I thought it's interesting. A lot of your when characters are like that. Though. None a of my of characters are macho. Yeah. Well, really, are they? <laughs> no, they but, are. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But what was interesting was I thought when I was a kid, I went through sort of this a kind of dinosaur phase. Kid boys particularly go through that. I was very very interested in monsters. I was very interested in werewolves and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And somehow the next step to these mad, gruesome, crazy people was the next sort of logical step. And in my mind, that was very much the attraction was this insanity and mad men, and, which is powerful in its way. And yes. They do weird things. They do really, yeah. you know, and, you know, I, I'd spend quite a bit of time in the book trying to get my head around gladiators but yes. you know that is such a popular but also strange activity it's horrible but it's gripping you know the number the number mm. of kids you see in rome um buying little model gladiators you know right. is they're in their millions <laughs> yeah. no it's fascinating and steve and i on here talk a lot about imagination and the function of imagination in culture and the function of imagination in consciousness and how we fantasize about ourselves the stories we tell ourselves the stories we shape about narratives and things like that we talk a lot about that and this new book of yours which is really great yeah emperor, emperor of rome, rome. all awesome. about the emperors really gets into that. It seems like that's a theme in your book is this idea of there's an imaginary emperor and there's a factual emperor. Yeah. And I thought that's an interesting place to start if you don't mind talking about that a little bit. It's a general question, but we could start maybe there because that's really interesting to me because I realized how much of it I'm imagining they were like. But then what's that a result of what they were imagining about themselves even too? I think that's the crucial point. And, um, you know, when I started thinking hard about the Roman emperor, 
I, my first instinct was to try to kind of white out the imaginary, you know, to say, yeah. look, there are all these anecdotes about Roman emperors who, you know, never wear the same pair of shoes twice or <laughs> eat very weird things or whatever. Now, I, I suspect that the vast majority of those aren't true or are hugely exaggerated. So I kind of sat down and, and thought, well, what does a story look like? If you tell the story of Rome without those anecdotes, without thinking, what did the Emperor Tiberius get up to in the swimming pool, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> if you, All of which you, I'd like to talk about. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happily. Um, <laughs> uh, and I suppose for a few months, I kind of had that sort of real, slightly boring austerity. And then I thought, look, this is, I'm, I'm really going the wrong direction here because those stories, even if they're not true, they're, they're literally true. They're true about the Roman imagination. You know, they are true about how Romans thought about their emperors. And we know from our own culture that uh, what we think about celebrities or what we think, you know, in the United Kingdom, what we think about the royal family is as historically important as what these poor mm -hmm. people get up to most of the time, yeah. which is almost certainly much more boring than we imagine. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is telling us, I mean, it's telling us about uh, our fantasies about them, but it's also telling us about our fantasies about ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we're always asking questions like, you know, who would I sleep with if I could sleep with anybody in the world? You know, <laughs> you know, if I could dress in any way, what would I put on? And so I think that, I, you know, I did quickly come to see that you have to concentrate on all these untrue stories that the Romans themselves told about, about emperors as much as trying to get to the truth. So it's a kind of... The book, in a way, is kind of bifocal. I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. you know, what do these poor guys do all day? Well, I have to say, they probably spent more time answering letters than they did yeah. having sex in the swimming pool, you know? Um, but the, the, the fantasies are really important, and they're fantasies that continue right down to now. I remember um, I was raised a Catholic, and when I was a kid, the Romans were imagined to be the bad guys of the story. Look, these guys are just awful. They're filled with cruelty. And then when I got older and I started studying philosophy, of course, I found Stoicism and I read Marcus and Seneca, and I thought, no, these are the heroes of the story. <laughs> and I just sort of switched, you know, and that's partly what you're doing also. You're, sh you're taking people that we've sort of demonized for sometimes good reason, showing they're not as bad as you thought. And then some people we've lionized and you're saying they were worse than you think they were. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's right. And I think it's it's very tempting, uh, particularly the further back you go in history. But even even now, I think, you know, it's terribly tempting to, you know, have a good is and bad is version of right. how things happened. And the closer you look, the more you see, you know, as you say, that you know, the goodies aren't quite so goody and the baddies aren't quite so baddy. And that's where history gets really interesting in trying to yeah. in trying to work out where you place yourself. You know, who you know, can you admire anybody in history? Mm. Can you want to be like <laughs> them? Well, yeah. you know, I, my answer to that is I don't, you know, I do not want to be a Roman ever, you know, thank you. So I, I do think about the Romans pretty much all the time, you know, I have to confess. Um, you have to. <laughs> but, but, because, you know, it's what I do. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I, I don't see myself in that story in any simple way. The Edward Gibbon Decline and Fall, I was reading this, not all of it, but parts of it, and he seems, he mentions cruelty a lot. He's sort of talking about the emperors, and he's, it, it makes it sound like the cruelty of the the top leader sort of, uh, flows down and makes the culture. It was cruel. a generally or, cruel culture, or yeah. I, I think the past is generally cruel. You know, wherever you go, and you, you know, people get very um, intrigued by you know the blood-stained corridors of power in ancient Rome, and you know, I'm a, you know, they were. I mean, there's no doubt that that ultimately, um, you know, the way of solving your problems in antiquity was to kill them, literally. Um, but I think you've got to remember that most corridors were pretty bloodstained in the ancient world. And you know, there aren't the mechanisms, they didn't have the mechanisms that we have to 
resolve conflict. You know, they fought it out either at kind of at state level or they fought it out at personal level. And uh, you know, it's, it's hard to you know, it's hard to admire Roman emperors. You know, I you know, have to admit that it's not easy to admire them. But I, I think they were much more part and parcel of a cruel culture than they were uniquely nasty. That makes sense. Yeah, the assassination and everybody bumping each other off and things like that. I'm going to get now. I'm going to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of the weirdness. Uh, there's a that. fantastic <laughs> chapter. There's a fantastic chapter in your book about food and how it relates to the culture and how it relates to the emperors. Because I guess there was a lot of poisoning going on as well, or allegedly poisoning and things like that. I was so. Were there? Is there? Was there truly such an office as the official taster of food? Yeah, did yeah. was there really guys who did this? <laughs> you. you if you went to a banquet with the Roman emperor, probably if you went for a simple supper party with the Roman emperor, um, there would be present food tasters, the pri gustatores, they were called, <laughs> uh, and they tasted the food, the toxin. And um, they were... It was a big deal because there were ranks of them. I, I show Amazing. in the book a, you know, a, a lovely guy. Well, we don't quite know how he died, actually, but um, oh. um, you know, but you know, he calls himself, or his family call himself, on his tombstone, you know, the manager of the food tasters. So you've got ranked <laughs> tasters, and I think that this is, uh, it's one of the things where you can see just how edgy it must have felt going to dinner with the emperor because, you know, you can see in practical terms that you know, if you're worried about poisoning, it's a good idea to have someone to taste your food first. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're a guest and you see a kind of battalion of food tasters, <laughs> you, what that tells you is that poison just might be yeah. on the menu. And, and it partly creates a, a culture of suspicion as well as being a sensible precaution. And it, it reminds me a bit about, you know, going on boats and ships, you know, when you see all the life belts and you think, well, I'm very glad they're there. But then you think, <laughs> but that means this boat might actually sink. <laughs> Why? Why are there so many? Yeah, yeah. But, it's, but it's an interesting thing too, because the, this idea of food and the food place being used as a place of power and kind of manipulating yeah. people and scaring people, it feels very kind of, it, it makes me think of the court of sort of like Stalin or something, you know, that there's this sense of keeping everybody off balance as a way of keeping people in place by being yeah. like, well, your food might be poisoned. Yeah. You never know. And, and you never quite know what to expect because if you were at the bottom of the pecking order you might actually get served fake food not real food you know? so wow. then you'd really know your place and so the <laughs> fake food is an indication that you're on the outs so you're somebody who's not i think it means you have to sit there with your tummy rumbling watching your betters oh, consume the goods <laughs> But is that the theater? Were they just creating a theater event of, you know, what's the purpose that's of that? That's so interesting. It was a it was a means of display. I mean, one one third century emperor did say that when he went to a dinner party, he felt he was like he was on the stage, and you know that's exactly your point, really. Um, I think that that hasn't entirely stopped. You know, yeah. I think that we know now that when you go to dinner with somebody, particularly if it's a formal dinner, um, that it's a way of controlling, displaying who's in and who's out. I, mean, you know, I come from University of Cambridge and we have we eat quite often sure. in colleges and I sit on, quotes, the high table at dinner <laughs> That's right. and I have better food and better wine <laughs> than the students who are eating below me. Well, you um, should. You deserve yeah, it. You I, deserve I didn't it. realize that actually meant you had better food. I just yes. thought it meant you were just raised and that was that no. was enough. No, no, no. Oh, really? <laughs> no, you have better food. And, <laughs> and but also, you know, we all know these kind of occasions, I think, when we get invited somewhere, we say, oh, I'm really pleased to be invited. You know, this is great. Well, it's great to go to you know, the boss or whatever. And then you find out that when you get there, you're at the very bottom of the table uh, and you're sort of half hidden behind some 
piece of furniture or a column or something. And you yeah. think, this means I know my place. You know, I'm both yeah. delighted to be here, but I am being told that I rank pretty low down. That's true. At this Super dinner. profoundly hierarchical society, yeah. the, the yeah. Romans. It's just well, incredibly. And, you know, and I, to some extent, I think we are when we come yeah. to eating. You know, the, Not America. The, no, no uh, class uh, in America. Uh, no, <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure. Uh, oh, absolutely. So, but but uh, you know, food, but, yes. Uh, yeah, yes, it's food. food is a real indicator. Yeah, and it and it's a, w a wonderful kind of uh, ambivalent indicator because partly it's meaning that we're all together. You know, we're all uh, sitting here. We're uh, sharing. You know, what could be more of a representation of our common humanity than that we uh, all sit down? But in fact, we're also being told where we rank. You know, who's yeah. who's sitting next to the host, right? Uh -huh. uh, who's not? There's often a performance of democracy. By by the Romans, there's a theater of democracy. Yes. We're, we're kind yeah. of, we're all there's a kind of we're all in this great Roman experiment together, but it's kind of bullshit. It's not really. <laughs> it's only part. I think I, I wouldn't say it's bullshit. I'd say it's only part of the story. Right? Uh -huh. You know, one thing you want your emperor to do is to be one of the lads and to get up nicely at the end of dinner and say goodbye, thank you very much for coming, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it sort of means something. And yet you also know that the whole scenario is about rank, hierarchy, power, and sometimes humiliation and sometimes death. I mean, you know, one of the best stories in the book, I think, is uh, about a third century emperor, Elagabalus, yeah. and he... Uh, one dinner party is said, and I don't believe this for a moment, but I think it's important. <laughs> uh, uh, he showered his guests with rose petals to show how you know what a, what a performance, what a display this was, what generosity, how much did that cost? You know, yeah. like, there were so many of them, however, that they smothered and died. <laughs> and God, I so, hope that's not true. <laughs> well, we, we See, I kind it. of do. I kind of you hope it's true. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think it's kind of interesting because it partly shows that this, he was a teenager, he's a teenage emperor. Yeah. Um, and it shows that he doesn't have, you know, he's, he, he's idiosyncratic, out of control, yeah. and a bit juvenile. But it also reminds you, and I think this is why the story gets told, is that when the emperor is being at his most generous, he's also at his most dangerous. Oh, you know? that's amazing. So it's kind of, so it's focusing you, not just on uh, a rather engaging and silly, if cruel thing. It's focusing you on how you can't ever trust the emperor, yes. even right. when he's nice. One thing that you talked about in the book, too, that was really uh, eye-opening for me is that most people, myself included, think that the emperor makes the empire. And you said it's kind of the other yes, way around, it's, it's, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. really interesting. Could you talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there is a, a terrible confusion of terminology because empire both means the conquered territories ruled by the Romans and it also means the period when Rome itself was ruled by a single emperor. Ah. And right, so we talk about the period of the Roman Empire, meaning the period when emperors ruled as, as single rulers. Now, the the real confusion here, and you know, you wish you could start to invent the terminology again, is that it seems natural to imagine that um, that the emperors, in the sense of one man rulers created the empire in the sense of Rome's conquered territory. Now, it's actually completely the other way around. Rome acquired 95% of its land uh, during the period of the Republic, the, the, the so sort amazing. of de the democracy. And Insane. in a way, in a way, it was the difficulty that they had with their rather primitive democratic institutions, actually, which had gone back for centuries and were, were built, really, for, for ruling a, a small city-state in mm -hmm. central Italy. They never adapted those institutions to ruling something on a much huger scale. And so what happens in the last century or so of that sort of democracy is that you get the rise of 
people who take charge, possibly for a short time, possibly for a mm. bit longer, um, partly doing what the people want. You know, you've got if you if you rule the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean is full of pirates, you do want someone to go and sort it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there is a tendency to give that kind of power to individuals, but that then breaks down the 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 real power sharing democracy that. Rome right. had had for centuries. And in the end, Julius Caesar is a kind of proto-emperor. Um, he finally kind of does away with that. And after Julius Caesar, whatever the claims the assassins made to wanting liberty, et cetera, et cetera, there was not a hope, really. And Augustus was more important, you think, because he kind of codified Who follows the Caesar. system yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. What happens after the um, the assassination of Caesar? Which, I mean, Brutus and Cassius, the lead assassins, are a, a nasty piece of work, actually, both of them. <laughs> um, and they've got very, very good press from William Shakespeare. And they're <laughs> damn lucky. See, that for was that. a fascinating thing to me that they're 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 kind of awful, self interested they're sort kind of. Kind of awful. They've got a good <laughs> slogan in Liberty. You know, we know that Liberty can often be. Uh, a very good slogan, but it often doesn't mean liberty. Yeah. And what happened after the assassination, which they pulled off, but um, but assassination is not itself all that difficult. It's what you do next that's hard. <laughs> and Brutus and Cassius didn't have a clue, frankly, what to do next. What did happen was over a decade of civil war, yeah. and almost from the word go, it was clear that they were not fighting for whether liberty was going to return. They were fighting for who was going to be the sole ruler. And in the end, it's Octavian who rebrands himself as Augustus, who takes a new name, who's the last man standing in the civil war. Yeah. But it takes 12 years or so. That to, that and in all that time, resolved. the average Roman on the street is going through his business while yeah. these guys are all killing each other and lunat lunatics running around. And your average Roman is just going through his day. And who's running it during that civil war? That's a very good question. And it's <laughs> and it's quite hard to to know how far the average Roman is going through his day. Uh -huh. I mean, I think that it's likely that this was really fought out at the top rather uh -huh. than it is likely. But there were times when in the city of Rome, people had a price on their head. Yeah. And, you know, if you literally beheaded somebody and took their head along, you get a reward. And there is at that period a complete breakdown of... Of, you know, I mean, Romans aren't good at law and order anyway, despite their great reputation. <laughs> yeah, they have a real legal, reputation for that. Legal codified. Yeah. But they know, you know, it's the Wild West with, you know, a superstructure yeah. of legal theory. Um, and so, you know, there's no police force. There is no way of um, ensuring control of the basic safety of the citizen. And so quite what it was like to live then. You know, it's a good point. You're, you're better off outside the city, I think. If you've got a nice small holding 50, 100 miles away from Rome, <laughs> That's probably good. keep your head down <laughs> yeah. and hope for the best. Speaking of people sort of outside the city, that most people, and particularly in this period when there were guys who were emperor for about five months, maybe a year, people didn't even really know who the emperor was necessarily. Didn't know his name necessarily, really didn't know what he looked like, except for the money, which I think is interesting. And are they the first ones to sort of coin, make coins with the guy, with the, with the guy's face on it? Is that? Um, there's a, there are a few precedents in among the Greek kings in the Eastern Mediterranean a bit earlier, but basically it was Julius Caesar who started the totally lasting tradition of putting the living ruler's head on the coin. Up to that point, there had been plenty of portraits on Roman coins, but they were all of dead guys. Um, nice. And it was seen as an absolute revolution to put the living, in Amazing. Julius Caesar's case, dictator's head. And that goes then right through. Until up, now. Until now. <laughs> up until yeah. now. And so the only way you're going to know that I don't know. Pertinax is the uh, emperor who's so obscure. <laughs> the only well way you're going to know is Paul. if you, some guy Pertinax. pays. I know. I like that guy. <laughs> the only way if somebody pays for it and you're buying fish in Spain and they hand you a coin, you go, oh, this is the emperor. This is the guy right now. And, I mean, I think everybody in the Roman 
territorial empire new after Augustus, so they were living under an emperor. There was That's where they paid taxes. And when we look at the way they talk about people in power, they'll often talk about the emperor. What happens if you dream? Is it a good sign to dream about the emperor? But uh, uh, yes and no is the answer to that. But it, it doesn't look as if those outside the elite in the provinces had much clue. Um, who they were. They, you know, they would get, they'd look at the coins and if they could read, they'd get some passing indication. But, you know, one of the reasons that I don't get hung up on biography in the book is because I think most Romans didn't. And even the educated found it hard. I mean, there's a, a wonderful papyrus that I illustrate that comes from the Roman province of Egypt. It's very neatly written. It's just a fragment, but it's very neat handwriting. And clearly this person, I imagine a man, but it could be a woman, um, has, was trying to make a list of emperors in chronological order with the length of their reign. And he gets some of them right, but he gets an awful lot of them wrong. Amazing. You know? And I think, well, if I sat down and I started yeah, to make right. a list of English kings, you know, right. I couldn't tell you what century Edward the uh, Third was. That's absolutely right. Yes, you know, I, I sort true. of know. I know about medieval yes, kingship. I feel I've better a, now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Better. Well, in, over because here, I think I think people have certainty, any certainty about maybe three presidents that they're pretty clear on. The rest of them are just who the hell knows where they. When are. I was uh, living, I lived in China on and off for the, for twenty years, and there was I, even now Americans will look at the Chinese and they think, oh. The government is is controlling you all the way down to the little person. But there's a saying in China that I used to hear, which is it's a very old saying. It's you know I I grow my crops, I I draw my water. What care do I have for the emperor? And it's like there's a whole world happening yeah, that right. they don't even yeah. know. They don't no, have any contact with the top level. No, it's similar. No, no, I think I think that's right. And there's you know, there's there's a kind of huge image we have of. You know, knowing our history. I mean, a friend of mine did um, was getting American citizenship, having been born British, and he had to learn up all the presidents and vice presidents. And when he, <laughs> wow, when he went, my God, when, you know, God, that's difficult. When he went for the interview, the person interviewing him said, "You know, could he name the twenty third vice president?" <laughs> and he said, "Yes." And the guy said, that's okay then. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to know. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. I passed that test. Wow, <laughs> vice presidencies. But this, is, difficult. But, but this makes me think, though, too, of you, you've emperors and then there's empresses. And they tend to, in our fantasy world, at least mine and how it's been handed down, be these kind of behind-the-scenes Bond villains who are kind, <laughs> yes, of, are. Yeah. Who are kind of the masterminds yeah. of the yeah. whole thing, which I always wondered about this and how much of this was propaganda, how much of this was meant to make the emperor look bad or... You're absolutely right. It is probably true that some of these women had more power in Rome than any women had had before in the city. That's probably uh -huh. true, largely because they were close to the emperor. And when you have that sort of palace monarchy, the people who sleep with the emperor or shave him in the morning or give him his massage or whatever, they have power because they are close to him and they can bend his ear. And I think that's that's certainly the case, that you find a sort of subversion of, of status and power when you get to the empire, because you know, the slave barber can tell the emperor what he thinks should happen. And do we know that this was actually happening? Yes, we, we pretty well do, yes. Somebody's barber was actually like... <laughs> to be strictly true, um, there are complaints that the traditional elite make about how they are excluded from power while the barber or the cobbler within uh, the palace has, oh, that geez. is different. Okay. It was certainly perceived. <laughs> but I'm prepared to go along with the idea that yeah. you know, there's, there is, in practical terms, there's more power for these very few individuals but who happen to be close to him. But I think that we have a rather more kind of dramatic image, as you say, of somehow, uh, particularly the wives or the daughters or the mistresses being the power behind the throne with a clear desire to control how high politics went. 
Mm. Yeah? And the, the classic case of that is Augustus's wife, Livia, mm. who um, uh, is, uh, you know, probably the best known poisoner in yeah. Roman history. And that rests entirely on the fact that Augustus sorted most things. He was a brilliant kind of reformer, um, a revolutionary reformer of Rome in all kinds of ways. But he never sorted succession. He never, yeah. uh, he never got succession sorted. And that was partly because he and Livia had no living children themselves. Uh -huh. uh, and so he had to look outside. And he chose a series of heirs all of whom died <laughs> until the only one left was Livia's son by her previous marriage who right. becomes the Emperor Tiberius. And mm. the, you can see that in trying to explain that, which might just be real bad luck, the story arises already in the ancient world. You know, they, they say, who was a beneficiary of all those deaths? Livia's yeah. son. So mm -hmm. who was behind all those deaths? It was Livia. She's used as a kind of way of explaining why that happened in a traditionally misogynistic way that we yeah. still use. I mean, uh, right now in the UK, um, we're debating why Boris Johnson made n not exactly a stunning success of um, the preparations against COVID. Mm -hmm. And what is being said? It's it was the... Mrs. Johnson. It was oh, Carrie. Right? Interesting. Now, yeah. we have no clue what happens you know, in yeah. the Johnson's flat and what <laughs> Carrie said <laughs> to <laughs> Boris. Absolutely no clue. We can only guess. But it's always easy to say blame the woman. And you know, that, is, that happens here. And there's presidents. a way, too, of being able to, because Tiberius, right, is, is, the, is the one who takes over from Augustus. That's her son. And so it's another way of defaming Tiberius, too, yeah, and saying, oh, he's not as good as the other guy was. Mm. And it's like, yeah. So it's all of that kind of clever use of propaganda. Oh, yeah, and it's all in a kind of, you know, a political set of debates, standoffs, um, enmities, and yeah. you're using, you know, is, is the emperor too much enthralled to his mum? That was often a question that was uh -huh. asked. And if the answer is yes, or really, it, that's one of the ways saying he's no good. You know, right. Mum, it's always mum. And sometimes that goes to, to extremes. And Nero is only one who was said to have had an incestuous relationship with mum. Oh, it's even like way before Freud. This was a this was a story that was being completely told. fascinating. I mean, all the incest stuff. How much again do we know? Is it true? Or again, is it a defaming tactic? Is it it's Suetonius? Like, is he the guy that like makes he, up his he, stuff? Or? He in part does. Tacitus um, has rather more subtle innuendo about it. And, and these are all these great Roman historians, yes. Suetonius and yes. Tacitus, yeah. And, yeah, who were writing these these epic histories. Uh, and modern historians have loved it. You know, they, mm -hmm. it's you know, a great story. Nero and his mum, and did they finally quarrel? And then he killed her, you know, because <laughs> he was wanting to have a nice young girl and mum was now a cast-off mistress and getting in the way. Uh, and the, the story writes itself. Whether Whether any of it is true, it's really hard. It's really hard to know. I, I mean, I think that you'd be you'd be foolish to say none of it was. But the problem yeah. is you can't say which bits are. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think it, in order to write the history of the of the empire, but particularly the of the the stories of the sequence of emperors, you've got to find a way of not getting hung up on trying to decide what exactly is true because you haven't. You, You've got no means to do that. But that's just, but it, it's, this is where my head starts to spin about history in general. I'm like, how do you do what you do, Mary yeah. Beard, if you have all <laughs> of this information? Yeah. And presumably you're getting more information as the sciences, archaeology, all these things get better. You're just getting more information, which maybe makes it easier or does it? Does it make it harder actually to decide? More information usually makes it harder, but it makes it richer. Yeah. And now I think in, in many ways, the fun of Roman history or the challenge of it is finding finding a way of talking about it that is has got, as it were, historical bottom. 
yeah. but doesn't pretend to know what it doesn't know. And I, I think a, a lot of modern history writing, um, and I'm not going to name any names, but it's a, it's a huge temptation to be, cer be too certain about mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, I hope that I found some ways around that, you know, by thinking about, so what is that anecdote telling us, whether it's true or not? And that's, you know, how do people think about the emperor? Yeah. And you can put that together a bit with much more um, down-to-earth, everyday bits of evidence about, you know, what the emperor did, the law cases that he adjudicated, mm. the way that he replied to the begging letters that came into him, because many of the emperor's replies are actually preserved. They're on papyrus mm. in Roman Egypt, or they're inscribed on stone and displayed um, in Italy, other parts of the empire itself. So you can, you can actually, in a strange way, see quite a lot of what the emperor does every day. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of that, I'm afraid, is pen pushing. Right. Yeah, one of, of the stories you told Massive was that he, he, he's dealing with such... I was ast I was astounded to find that he was dealing and adjudicating really like small micro offenses, like this chamber pot comes <laughs> yes. out of a window. What was that story? Yes. It's a great it's a, story. Uh, this is a wonderful story, which ends up on the Emperor Augustus's, you know, in his intro, <laughs> right? Amazing. And it's from Canidos in modern Turkey. And there's, there, there's been a long-running kind of warfare between two families, two rival families in the city. And one of the families obviously goes around and bashes up the house of the other family at night on a regular basis. <laughs> the, the family inside the house get annoyed and they tell their slave, what a fair slave, to go upstairs and pour the contents of a chamber pot on the head of the people who are being a right nuisance underneath. <laughs> the slave does this, but also, whether, whether it's on purpose or not, I don't know, um, he drops the chamber pot as well as the contents. And the chamber pot hits one of the guys on the head and kills him. Oh, wow. So, oh, so you've got, <laughs> you know, I've got a dead marauder outside. <laughs> and the, the local authorities in Knidos think, oh, what do we do now? And they, they think, well, this is a case of murder, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. they are for um, uh, prosecuting the family for murder, not the slave, but the owners of the slave. Uh, they take their case, we don't know quite how they manage this, but they take their case to the Emperor Augustus, who obviously reads through this, what must have been slightly kind of, uh, well, fascinating, but occasionally tedious documentation about it. <laughs> yeah, <right>. And Augustus, <laughs> or whether he's advised by his advisors or not, we don't know, decides it was legitimate self-defense uh, and they get let off. That's amazing. That's, That's hilarious. <laughs> Just it's, insane. It is. I mean, it's great because what it reminds me of, you know, that is that uh, if you write about the emperor, you're not just writing about you know, posh white men at the very top of Roman society. You're seeing through yeah. the emperor's eyes yeah. the lives of the ordinary people actually yeah. in more detail than almost any other way of reaching those lives yeah. because they are bringing their problems about their dead cow that's got killed in enemy action, <laughs> things like this. They're bringing those to the, to the well, emperor and, and you, you see them in technicolor. I wonder if in any way that was sort of promoted as look at the emperor as such a good father to his people, he can oh. even make a judgment about this chamber pot yeah, thing. Yeah. Look at, he's so, looks over the empire, so cares, he's so caring, he's so warm, he's such a good man that he'll even look at this. There is a branding exercise going yes. on here in part. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it cannot possibly be that every little case could find its way onto the emperor's desk. And we do get some replies where the emperor says, you should take this up with the governor of the province. You know, so <laughs> having nothing actually to do with it, replying, but it's a kind of rubber stamp reply saying, take it back to where it came from. Um, but you, you do... You do see that people are using their contacts to 
find a way actually to get to him and let some of those do. There's a, a, another lovely case that I talk about, a little town in the Balkans, which is having real trouble because the, the Roman soldiers from the nearby bases are coming and trashing their town every now and then. They think, you know, we can't stand this. We're going to have to move. We can't, you know, we can't have these awful squaddies turning up, um, <laughs> you know, getting absolutely blind drunk and ruining our nice little <laughs> town. And a, a long, long sort of account of this, you know, sob story um, arrives at the emperor's desk um, uh, you know, and there's some sort of reply, which does partly involve saying that you should take this here and there. You think, how did this town reach? How did they find yeah. out how to do this? Yeah. Then you see, who is the guy who's actually put the case? And it's a man in the Praetorian Guard, the Emperor's Guard, uh -huh. who actually came from the town in question. Uh -huh. Originally. So you can see that what must have happened is they must have said, to this, you know, this local lad who'd ended up in Rome, you know, can you help us with this? You know, perhaps you could get the emperor to do something about it. And yeah. that's what he does. So underneath some of these uh, apparent random cases yeah. that, that arrive on the emperor's desk, you suspect that there's somebody who knows somebody who has a role yes. in the palace. That's amazing. It's the, the the amount of this kind of amazing detail with the Romans is one of the things that makes it so fascinating to me too. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be any of this kind of granular detail with any other classical cultures. You talk about this in the book as uh, the mobility of people in Rome is an interesting question. Like how do you move from one, like this guy you talk about, a Thrax or Maximinus, he was kind of like a, a so-called barbarian and he ends up as emperor for a short time anyway. So there was, there was mobility, but it, I think when we look back on it, we oftentimes don't see that. And then sort of the second part of this question is, you know, we know that there's slavery in Rome, but it's not, my understanding is, and you please correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't the skin color based slavery that we're accustomed to in the Atlantic slave trade. It was a different kind of thing. And I wonder if you could explain a little of that. No. I mean, broadly, I think the answer in a, in a way to both those questions, but I'll come to the ethnicity of slaves in a minute, is that Rome is, is that funny combination of absolutely rigidly hierarchized culture combined with a dramatic amount of social mobility within it. And mm -hmm. again, that is what makes it seem so, um, so surprising to us yeah. um, that they senators can wear different shoes from people um, below them in rank, and yet people are becoming senators. Mm -hmm. And that again, I think is is well, it may be more typical of hierarchical cultures than we imagine. You know that the, the, the hierarchy is partly sustained because they do take. Oh, uh, you let people move people. around. Yes, interesting. Yeah. You, let, you let people move on. The question you just put is is the reason why it is very very hard to compare Atlantic slavery with Roman slavery. If you asked a, an elite Roman to close their eyes and think of an enslaved person, they would probably see a red haired German. Now, some people from Africa did become slaves. People from everywhere became slaves. And Romans, if they got captured by other people in unsuccessful warfare, they became slaves. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, interesting. The, the removal of those basic citizen rights was, was part of the whole culture. Uh, and it was not restricted to any particular social group. Interesting. And that obviously makes it an extremely different scenario from any kind of modern slave culture that we, we know. And, and Roman slaves, at least domestic slaves, and I'm pretty certain that this would not have gone for slaves who worked the mines or slaves that worked the fields, but domestic slaves were regularly freed, probably in their 40s or 50s, uh -huh. uh, and they, at that point, gained almost every political right that a freeborn Roman citizen had. Wow. Uh, they couldn't hold political office, but their sons could, 
Mm. And very many of the, um, the the famous people we know yeah. in Rome have got uh, have got uh, slaves amongst their ancestors. I mean, yeah. the the famous Roman poet Horace, who's almost the poet laureate under Augustus, his dad had been a slave. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, yeah. and some people reckon that by the time you get to let's say the second century CE, and this is very much a guesstimate, but something like half the population of the city of Rome would have had slaves somewhere in their ancestry. Uh -huh. So it, oh, that is really amazing. very, very fluid. It doesn't make slavery any better, right, um, right. but it makes it different. And it, it's also the case that some of the slaves, and there are very few in number, and they are not typical slaves, who work in the imperial palace, are in positions of considerable administrative authority. Now, they still get sneered at by the freeborn um, oh, citizens yeah. also. You know, so it, Rome is, you know, interesting again, because they're both appallingly snobbish um, <laughs> uh, and yet uh, provide access. Of, Strangely magnanimous. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, That's it's kind of a very, <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, it's probably more, uh, uh, it's probably quite a typical ambivalence, I think, in, in all cultures like that. So it's a it's a real uh, mishmash of different statuses, and then you get people. You mentioned Maximinus Strax, who was um, an ordinary soldier, really, who came from Thrace and apparently couldn't read, but that's probably a slur. Who becomes emperor uh, in the third <laughs> century? But I think more, almost more interesting, is the fact that you have a really widespread of people from all over the empire who do become emperors quite early. Yeah. And Trajan and Hadrian both come from Spain. Right. Uh, probably they had Italian ancestry. They were right. they were soldiers who'd settled in Spain, but they think of themselves as their hometown is in Spain. Septimius Severus comes from Libya. Elagabalus, he of the rose petals, he comes from Syria. Oh. And so there is at the top of Roman society, as well as at the bottom, there is an increasing sense of diversity. Speaking now of Elagabalus, because 12-year-old me doesn't want to lose sight of the fact that some of these guys really did seem bananas and seemed pretty <laughs> crackers. And and to do because I just I want to be sure that we took I'm fascinated by the games and the and the theater and stuff like that and how a big a part of the culture it was and i'm always surprised because i've seen the statues of i can't remember which emperor it was who's dressed as Her hercules Commodus. and he's Commodus. Yeah. yeah and that Commodus. these guys were sort of and nero was did did some some acting and was considered himself an actor and this is this is true we know that this is true and we know that some of it's true i mean there's a wonderful story told about Commodus, who clearly does, like many other emperors, start to perform as a gladiator, either publicly Crazy. or semi-publicly. I, mean, I don't think he ever loses, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's one great story told by um, a historian who was actually an eyewitness of the occasion, a guy called Cassius Dio, uh, who was watching Commodus at the end of the second century in the gladiatorial arena, he was actually fighting animals and he uh, just killed an ostrich, <laughs> which had been penned up to make it a bit easier for him. Uh, <laughs> no. And once he's killed the ostrich, he decapitates it and he goes over to the senators who are sitting on the front row like they always do in the in the Colosseum, goes over to the senators and he holds up the ostrich head and he holds off his sword and he kind of gestures to kind of cutting the ostrich's neck oh. and he looks at them oh. as if to say, you next, guys, you next. Oh, oh really? Um, and oh. Dio says he didn't know what to do, you know, he just didn't know what to do because, you know, although it was scary, he, he nearly got the giggle. Because it was also <laughs> funny. It's, it's an ostrich head. <laughs> and yeah, right. Just, oh and so God. he he takes. He's wearing his laurel wreath because when you go to the Colosseum, 
you know, you dress up as if you're going to the opera now. It's very wow. formal dress. Oh, so it um, wasn't sort of rabble of it's like. It's not crazy. rabble at all. That is a oh, complete. You know, this is formal where everybody has to wear their toga and they have to have, um, you know, the, the, the tofts have laurel wreaths on. And the toga is fancy dress. The toga is like dress it up. Yeah, the toga is the kind of dinner jacket. We kind of think that the Romans went around wearing togas, well, you know, only on posh occasion. Not. Uh -huh. they, they weren't sort of um, uh, doing their everyday jobs wearing tokas. That were changes little... everything. That, that it does. actually changes it my makes whole it a completely <laughs> different. Yeah, yeah, it makes it a completely different thing. It does. It actually makes it weirder that everybody's sitting there in their essentially their black tie watching guys stab exactly. each other. Exactly. It That's, makes it weirder. It makes it weirder. I and mean, you that it's easy to understand if you if you just want to say they're baying for blood, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They're not quite baying for blood. They're mm. they're sitting there being very formal. But on this occasion, Dyer doesn't know what to do because he's got the emperor looking a complete idiot. Um, and he thinks, I'm going to laugh, but if I laugh, that would be disastrous. So he picks a, a leaf out of his laurel wreath and he bites on it very hard <laughs> to, in order to stop himself laughing. You know, and it's it is this kind music. of, it, you know, like a one, it is like church <laughs> or it's detail. like, you know, it's the seven-year-old of school and you're biting on your ruler <laughs> Fantastic or detail. And, That's such a great uh, detail. And it's marvellous. And, and yet it still remains, as you say, quite hard to see what is going on here because there are constant references to emperors as being in some ways perverted performers. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's Commodus who is being a gladiator, many others try that. Uh, Nero uh, is best known, he doesn't much like gladiators actually, he's, he's best known for theatrical and musical displays. Mm -hmm. He starts to perform publicly and he, he, he said he has the theatres locked so no one can leave uh, when the <laughs> performance is going on. Yeah, uh, Paul does that too. Yeah, no. yeah, I do that. I do that too. <laughs> and, um, and there are stories of people um, pretending to be dead so that they can be taken out and women giving birth in the middle of the performance. And pretending it, to be dead. Fantastic. It is a huge thing. It's an absolute huge thing throughout all these anecdotes. And I, I don't have a simple answer to it, but, but somewhere at the bottom yeah. of this, there is a big Roman question, which is why these anecdotes are so pressing. There's a big Roman question about whether the emperor is just a performer. Is the emperor authentic? Is he like, is he really an actor? Is When Nero acts, is he actually showing you that that's all the emperor is, really? Fascinating. And Fascinating. Very recently, there was a great anecdote about the late Queen Elizabeth in the UK who one of her last big public performances was when, to celebrate one of her jubilees, she did a, a, a performance, an acting performance with Paddington Bear, um, children's uh, character, oh, yeah. who'd, yeah. who'd come to tea in Buckingham Palace. And it's, a, it's a, a, a wonderful vignette of the Queen pouring out tea for Paddington Bear. <laughs> and uh, the, one of the guys involved in making that was recently interviewed, and he said that afterwards he said, to the Queen, um, you really are a very good actor, Mum. <laughs> and uh -huh. she said, are you surprised? <laughs> it's all I do. It's all wow. she does. That's it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh -huh. And you think, but actually, actually and it's funny too, that's he, it. Yeah. Yeah, and hearing that anecdote's funny because you kind of go, in 500 years, that will look bizarre too, that the queen was like poor for a cartoon <laughs> bear. Yeah, it's, can, like, it's completely you, crazy. That, yes, you can imagine, you know, you can imagine what the downside story of that is. That she was so, so bonking, bonking so man, that she had to with a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is really so. Are you saying even con even contemporaries would say we're, we're asking these questions I about like so. and so this whole idea of just general legitimacy, like who's really a real emperor, is not a guy who's going to be like running around dressed like Hercules <laughs> and or like because it's the equivalent of one of our presidents running around like Spider Man or something. And, <laughs> or are they saying? Look, actually, I'm revealing to you, yes, that's yeah. all it is. And Augustus's last words, as reported, and you know, no last words are ever actually uh, accurate, I don't think. But he is said to have said on his deathbed, 
uh, with his, um, some of his advisors and family around him. If I have played my part in the comedy of life, well, give me a clap. Wow. Yeah. And, he, he, you know, and Augustus is, in a sense, the classic good emperor. And That's yet great. those last words are sort of recognising, like Queen Elizabeth, that to be a monarch is to be a performer. Amazing. Speaking of death, there's a fantastic anecdote that I just have to mention towards the end of your book, where I guess sometimes the bodies were so mangled or decomposed, they would use wax effigies, <laughs> yeah, which is some... already, that's getting weird. But again, that doesn't sound unlike Lenin's body, which right. looks like a wax German effigy. German Mao. Yeah. yeah, Mao and all that stuff. But it's but what's fantastic is they put out the wax effigy of, I think it was Pertinax, my favorite <laughs> yes, emperor. Yes. <laughs> yes, they put it out. And that... Not only did they do that, but to but to continue the charade that it was really him, they had a guy sitting there, a slave sitting there with a fly swatter, <laughs> pretending to swat flies away yeah, as if right. it was really his body. That's, and that's, that's crazy. Right. That it's crazy. Right. And then I, I do say at one point, sometimes you do wonder how the Romans kept a straight face. You know? <laughs> yes. because, you know, and they also have, they have doctors kind of saying he's not getting any better. <laughs> <laughs> Guys standing around. That's so strange. It's, I mean, it's totally weird. But again, I think it's asking you to say, right, is this, is, is this what imperial power is, really? Yeah, yeah. You know, are they actually wax effigies that we're all pretending are real? And yes. uh, we treat these anecdotes as if they're very silly, and they are very silly, and they're very funny. And you know, I've, I have enjoyed um, laughing at them as everybody does. Yes. Uh, but uh, underneath, there, the, as with all strange things, yes, there is a more important point. Yes. Yeah. That's what I think. I in the end, your book did for me, and brought me. It's it's that it's that realization that. The weirdness is is deep and meaningful. Actually, it's not just weirdness. It's no, really no, that's right. It's, it's weirdness with a point. This went on for hundreds of years. It's not just it's not just silliness. It's not just weirdness. It is weirdness making a point about things. And just as weird now, in some yes. ways. Yeah. We have like uh, now. I, we, we want to be mindful of your time, and you, yeah, I, I know, know you've, you've got to go. But I, I just want to make one one more point. Was you talk a lot about autocracy, you know, in the book, and we're living in a in a moment now where there's a lot of autocratic power machinations, and and I'm just thinking like if the the just like the emperors, we thought they were running the show, and actually, it's a deep state kind of thing. Yeah, that's something mo both sort of like relieving about that because some of these wackadoodles then aren't important, but yeah. there's also something creepy about it because yeah. that means the machinery below yeah. the autocrat is also a rapacious, you know, imperial yeah. power, too. Yeah, no, it is. I, and I think that those are the kind of questions that Roman history helps you. Oh. Yeah. Ask and answer. I, I mean, not. I mean, when President Trump was president, um, the commonest question I got from journalists was, "What what Roman emperor is he right. looked like?" Oh, yeah. interesting. And, and I always used to say Elagabalus, um, not because <laughs> not because I thought that was true at all, but I thought they wouldn't have heard of Elagabalus. So <laughs> <laughs> um, Look it up. <laughs> yeah, then they'd have to Google it. Yeah, right. you know? um, plus, I, I I think that it's at that just that second deeper level where you do start to see. Um, some of the big questions about autocrats, about who's running the show, and about how how people critique empire and how they critique yeah. their rulers. And you know, quite recently, um, Rishi Sunak in the UK got into trouble for being an actor because, in fact, he wanted to show that he was a real man of the people, which he certainly isn't. And <laughs> he went to and, and he wanted to reflect problems with fuel prices. So he went to fill up his car with petrol, but he had to borrow a small car so he didn't look as if he was oh, really right. grand. And he That's clearly the same didn't, thing. He didn't know how to work a petrol pump, um, <laughs> really. And uh, so what it revealed yeah. was that this was an act. And a then charade. You say, so if this is a charade, where's the power really? And that's yeah. one of the questions that's being asked. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, we have hit our final moment yeah. with yes. you, Mary Beard. We did Thank that you, very Mary. well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank, a real Thank pleasure. You. Nice to talk to you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.
that was a great conversation. Amazing. Fantastic. She is, yeah, I, I feel like uh, listening to Mary, like you can feel your IQ rising. She makes us smarter. Amazing ability to put an incredible amount of thought and information into just really accessible space so that it's really, she's amazing. And that stuff is fascinating to me. I don't know why I'm all, I've just always been fascinated by the Romans. And it's, it's amazing to be able to talk to her. So many weird things. So yeah. The stuff about stories. the, the stuff you were asking her about the food and the games and also the stuff about acting is really interesting because you do that for a living and yeah. the, the emperors are kind of doing it as well. Yeah. Well, I've always, and I was so, I wanted to ask her, but I've always, cause I know that a lot of the emperors ended up sort of hanging out with actors and actors started hanging out in the court which I've always yeah, thought was why? a bad sign. I don't know. I think it's a bad <laughs> sign. Low character. I think, yeah, I think it's a sign of a decline in, you know, <laughs> of things declining, of people's morals declining, you know, because I think once you start palling around with actors in, that, the, <laughs> in the seats of power, you're like, you're definitely on the way. I wonder, I do wonder too, like what they thought of actors, whether they were, I, and I think they did have a, still a low opinion of them, which it seems like most people have always had low opinion. I don't know. Like, um, I feel like now, I think, I feel like d actors get a lot of respect now. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, you're the one who's in the seat, but. Well, exactly. And once again, I feel like actors are kind of like, people are palling around with actors more. So it's a bad sign. That's a bad sign. <laughs> I think it's a bad sign. I really do. Where it's the end. I, I also, I, as a professor, I feel like uh, the American culture doesn't respect professors that much. <laughs> Whereas like in, in like China and in, I think in parts of Europe, professors are more celebrated or there's more respect for them. I feel like, but that's the insider's point of view. But as an actor, like, do you feel like, it's almost like there's two levels of actors. There's people who, who are artistically respected. Yeah. And then yeah. there's sort of like people who are just um, doing I don't know, yeah. a craft. I don't know. It's a fiction. They're all the same thing. I mean, it really okay. is. It's all the same. And as far as I'm concerned, it's all the same, same gig. Some people just make it look classier. <laughs> and some people pull off a classy thing than other people do, you know? I mean, but it's all the same thing. It's And like, then people, people want you, like once they've seen you in one kind of thing, they want you to stay in that kind of thing. If they like, do you play a certain true. kind of part? Like do drama because, you know. Sure, that can happen for sure. Yeah, definitely people can. And, you know, it's it's a weird, it's a weird business. It's a weird profession. <laughs> it's a very weird profession. <laughs> but but I think that's fascinating, the idea that these guys in power are actors in some way. Yeah. Is true. I mean, so much of it is is acting. And I look at uh, American presidents yeah. or British monarchs. Yeah. Some of them have had ties to acting. Even even True. the Cambodian, um, uh, the king of Cambodia during like the 70s was making little films and stuff. Was He had like his own little film company and wanted to do acting. Really? And I think even his children, some like some of the sons also went into acting. So there is some connection there. There's a definite power. connection between them, politics and performance yeah. and stuff like that. Anyway, super interesting, Mary Beard. Yeah. What a pleasure. And she was what a fantastic. pleasure to be with you again, Professor Stephen Asma. Likewise, my friend. Indeed. And, and Mary sort of appreciated the weird, just as yes. our fans do. So wag on, weirdos. Indeed. Chinwag is a production of Treefort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Treefort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Editing and mixing by Jeff Neal. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod. <laughs>